I want to show off a little of what I've been working on this week because I have it in a state that actually lets me do some interesting things. So I'll pull open the spellcrafting interface here. And if you've been following the blog, I talked a lot a few weeks ago, last week I think, actually, about uh, making these runes. And I showed that I could make them pretty fast. And so because I'm able to do that, I actually haven't been making runes this week because I'm already confident in my ability to turn those out quickly. What I've been working on instead is um, basically adding stuff into the game, adding 3D objects that you can create with code. And so in order to show that off, I'm just going to use this one rune, which actually opens up a, uh, a text editor. So I could say something like build here. And this basically this lets me prototype things much more quickly than using the build. Um, yeah, there we go. There it is. That's exactly the same as as if I had uh, if I had used this rune and put two parentheses runes around it. It's faster for me, really probably faster for anyone who knows how to code in text. But what I can also do is um, add a beam to the world. So a beam is uh, just one of the particle effects that I have been dealing with. And uh, I think it looks pretty cool. Yeah, there it is. So. Uh, this one looks like fire, and I have several others I've shown off in previous videos, but today I'm not going to talk about the kinds of particles because that's, uh, that's easy to change. I'm going to talk instead about how these particles, these beams, can be assembled together to make larger, more interesting apparatuses with code. So let me just, uh, for my next trick, instead of just a beam, let's try a spinning beam spinning beam. Actually, you know what? Let's save that one for a little while. Let me just do something that might look familiar to anyone who's been following the blog. So I'll do up large beam. And so for those of you who have been following the blog, up large changes the location that the spell takes effect at so that it's not where it, the projectile lands, but uh, up some distance, large distance. You know, and of course, large is relative. That's a large distance right there. It's roughly the roughly the distance you can jump. And of course, if you wanted it higher, you could do up large again. Oh, and I actually happened to land on this. Uh, there's an invisible uh, there's an invisible collider right there, as you can probably see, and uh, and it does affect physics, including, for example, where um, where the character can stand. So that's kind of cool. Looks like I'm I'm flying on a uh, on a particle. So let's make an up large spinning beam, uh, which you can probably imagine what that, that will produce. <clears throat> yeah, there it is. So now it's again roughly roughly at the level where I can jump to. Oh, almost got on top of it. And it uh, and it spins around kind of like an arm. As a child of this beam, let me add an additional beam but up some medium amount, which is roughly the length of the beam itself. Let's see if that works. Yeah, yeah. So we have a beam and we have a second beam that is its child. So this, this beam at the, at the top on line one, that'll be the parent beam. And then let's we have an up medium beam right there. Um, let's do an up medium another beam. And let me try to rotate this one. So I'll say it's a rotated beam. 0, 90, 0. Let's see if that works. And uh, if it does, I'm going to try to clean this up because I don't like having to say up medium twice. I think there's a shorter way. Let's uh, put it on the here. Yeah, that's what I expected to happen. OK, interesting. Yeah. Well, let's carry on with that then. So like I said, up medium being repeated twice, that, that bothers me as a programmer. Obviously, what I'd like to do is take just my rotated beam 
and put it inside of a medium. Now I happen to know because I've been playing with this all day it doesn't quite work that way um, for reasons that I will not explain because I'm most likely going to change it but right now just to get it to work what I can do is say that um, up medium is going to affect this list comprised of a beam and a rotated beam um, all of which will be children of this beam right here so if this works it should create basically the same thing as before but let me change it a little bit just to make sure that uh, you know make sure it's not picking up the same changes last time let's do 180 uh, let's just go full windmill here and do 180 and 270 pack my parentheses here not because I have to but because I think it looks better when I do and let's see what we got let's put that one. yeah there it is you can see the four prongs of that windmill I can even jump on it and um, of course of course of course I'm going to make it spin in just a moment but first let me uh since you know I am a coder and I have standards I'm going to uh, going to refactor this a little bit because uh, although Lisp or Racket is my favorite language. Uh, I don't like anything in any language getting too long. So I'm going to take this list of four beams and let's uh, let's move that into a function definition. Let's define that as windmill top. Those those right there. Um, and so up we'll say there's a beam and then up medium wind mill top and again I think this should be the same let's see if that works yep yep definitely and of course now that it's uh now that it's a function there's no reason we can't make as many windmill tops as we want so we said up medium windmill top why don't we go ahead and, as another child of this beam here on line 11, let's do up medium, up medium. And for those of you wondering, I'm not allergic to numbers. I like having these constants, large, medium, and small, because they give my whatever I build a kind of regularity to them. But um, if I'm not mistaken, you can pass in a number here and put things wherever you want and you don't even have to use up I think there is a uh, I think there is a construct called at and then you can say whatever numbers you want here so you you have as much control as you want I'm just choosing not to use it at the moment so let's try up medium up medium windmill top done done let's see if now we have two mill tops yeah totally yes we got two windmill tops there that's the power of putting things in functions use them as many times as you want let's have this be a spinning windmill top let's say done and remember there's two windmill tops that get created and it, only one of them should spin notice before in the background you can see that one spinning beam so spinning Spinning makes a beam spin, but what this will do if it if it works, if there's no bugs, is we should see all four of those beams spin because spinning is wrapped around all of them. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, look at that. So now we have one spinning windmill and one not spinning windmill. And I should be able to get on top of that if I try hard enough, but uh, yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, there we go. Oh, I was on there for a second. Yeah. And then, of course, if we wanted the top one to spin instead, not, not too hard. In fact, I feel like anyone should be able to figure that out, even if this is your very first time encountering this language that I've invented. That's done. Yep, so now the top one is spinning. 
So here we have the bottom one spinning, there we have the top one spinning. And they both peacefully coexist in the same world because they were created with different codes, so they both will happily do their job um, enacting the code as written at the time when I cast the spell. Let's do, uh, let's try doing something kind of crazy here. Um, instead of spinning this windmill top, I suppose we could spin just one of the windmill beams. It might not look as cool, but it's a good test. So we're going to push that spinning expression into the windmill. So we should see one beam on each of those windmill tops spin and the rest shouldn't. Yep, there it is. There it is, yep. So we get one, one windmill spinning, one beam on each windmill spinning. One more example here. Um, and uh, let's do, Let's do another up medium spinning beam, but as a child of this beam right there. Weird spinning arm, sort of like how that looks. Let's try adding, uh, let's add one more level. So we'll take this up medium spinning beam and we'll make that be a child of this beam right here. And yes, I know this is getting to be a crazy expression. And yes, I know we could define a function to shorten it up considerably, but let's not do that now. Let's be lazy programmers. Yeah, so now we have four. Notice that uh, I'm using the fact that there's a, an invisible collider on these beams to, uh, to cite with an additional spell. So I cast the spell and it collided with, with the beam and then it put my weird spinning arm up there as well. And so it created a kind of strange, strange additional apparatus. I suppose I could use the same trick right there. Let's see if I can just on one. Oh yeah, now I have two arms. I must have timed that perfectly because those two arms are perfectly in sync. Um, I didn't do that. This next one will probably be different. Yeah, there we go. Wow, that looks pretty cool. I like the way that looks, actually. Um, oh, I nailed it again. Those are perfectly in sync. That is awesome. Cool. Anyway, um, review. Yes, here again, I was showing, uh, showing how to construct the windmill, constructing it bit by bit, um, showing that I could move beams up into the air and showing that I could make them spin. And then here was the very first one we cast, which was just beam all by itself. That was the short adventure we went on as exemplified by the bizarre apparatuses we can see in the distance here. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the uh, the first, uh, I guess, narrated coding experience for code spells. I'll see you all later. Thank you again. If you've been supporting us on Patreon, I really, really appreciate it. We could not be doing this without you, and your support means a lot to me.